welcome back to Aimless Ramblings, uh, where your cool trio will be discussing another to- um, topic. Uh, today we're going to be discussing personhood and citizenship. Um, and to begin our discussion, I'll be handing over to Tim, who will be discussing citizenship as a privilege. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, so... Basically, the idea that I was going to discuss uh, sort of stems from concepts of global justice and uh, equity between uh, all the peoples of the globe and the issues that citizenship can provide in in, in this sort of concept. So if you accept, and once again, there's a big if there, uh, if you accept that it's it's a good thing that people should have somewhat equitable outcomes or at least somewhat equitable inputs to their life, uh, citizenship can seem uh, like a pretty arbitrary uh, lottery. Uh, so in terms of like a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, I don't think if we were going to establish a global society, regardless of whether or not you were going to accept different cultural groupings, etc., uh, that you would allow for the distribution of wealth uh, access to uh, healthcare, access to educational opportunities, or even just life expectation outcomes uh, that comes with citizenship. And, th- and I, I'm specifically talking here about citizenship, I suppose, as opposed to uh, just pure location of birth or, or migration. Like 100% individuals do have the ability to move, uh, although different uh, legal regimes can make it more difficult for individuals moving and emigrating to different countries. Uh, And and one of these issues is the issue of citizenship. So citizenship as as an individual like uh, can grant you access to many different things uh, in terms of uh, both you know cheaper healthcare access to the education system but also provides a sense of uh, belonging in the nation that you move to and uh, in some cases, sense of stability, because I mean, like for instance, if you're looking at places like uh, in America with like you know the Dreamers generation and that kind of stuff, you have people who uh, potentially may themselves or their, at least their parents be removed from the country through deportation uh, as illegal immigrants. However, on the other hand, uh, citizenship, particularly for some countries like I don't know Italy is a great example, uh, there is sort of like almost like a blood right uh, of citizenship that passes down to, say, the second or third generation. So people who have never lived in Italy, people who don't speak Italian, uh, who don't contribute any tax necessarily to the uh, Italian uh, state, still have a right to citizenship. In some cases, uh, as we saw in Australia with the citizenship saga, uh, they may not even know that they have a right to the citizenship, but it has been automatically conferred on them. So... I suppose uh, the question I would pose to uh, both Sam and Simon uh, is citizenship merely a, uh, as it is currently conceived, a a form of privilege which is used to lock certain groups out of access to, you know, an equitable, uh, you know, uh, place in society or do you think that, uh, and, and as a counter argument, this citizenship also has something to do with common duties and, and being bound together? And in which case, could citizenship be the salvaged, or does it even need salvaging? Potentially, is it, is it right as it is uh, to fit our current global society? Sam, I was just um, thinking. Saw an article this morning on Insiders, and it's um, I think quite appropriate, considering I think um, just today. Uh, a man's having his Australian citizenship um, stripped by, hopefully, in the eyes, hopefully, of the government by um, Peter Dutton. I think he was um, charged with terror offences for plotting to do whatever, whatever. Um, but the man's a dual, dual national and he's having his Australian citizenship stripped. And it's incredibly unlikely that his, the, his country of origin would ever accept him back. So he'll essentially become, you know, in terms of functional law, a person non grata or whatever, personal, whatever. Tim, what's it called? Stateless person. Uh, A stateless person is probably fine. Uh, Yeah. Um, So stateless functionally, right? Which means he's not covered by protections in Australia really and can be indefinitely detained. So I think it's, you know, you've got this guy that, could, could possibly live shoulder to shoulder the majority of his life to all these people. And then by revoking the citizenship, he all of a sudden drops to, you know, the lowest tier rights available. 
So I definitely do think that, like, as you're saying, citizenship doesn't conf does confer rights that are unequal throughout the world. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. In relation to terrorist law, uh, it's very interesting to see how they exploited the sort of because uh, one of the baked in ones to uh, the terrorist laws placed in Australia is that you can't physically make somebody stateless as a protection so that we can't, you know, indefinitely think. But the fact that by simply like lip service saying that he still has a second citizenship, so that technically is thing, uh, they're using that to sort of exploit the system to be able to. Uh, pretty much make him stateless. Uh, I, I was unaware that that was a possibility, but you know, there's always a, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, but yeah, um, definitely, I feel that. But then there's also the idea of does technically being of a particular state, so having a particular citizen to a state also not only gain privilege, but also um, gains a sort of a stigma. And that that's another thing, uh, specifically with uh, a lot of people who fled... Uh, during the end of World War Two, trying to hide their previous citizenship, whether the simple fact that they could be traced back to it was sort of a negative. Anyway, uh, Tim? Well, uh, definitely, Simon. I would say that probably the best example of that is the detention of German, Italian, and Japanese nationals in places like Italy, uh, sorry, Australia and the US throughout the Second World War because it was assumed that they would be uh, – spies or agents for the country which uh, which was of their original nationality uh, I suppose though sort of to throw a cat amongst the pigeons uh, a counter argument that could be made about uh, citizenship being just a privilege is that that's sort of a utilitarian way of looking at it, but from more of a like deontological position citizenship is not just about accesses to things it's also about a series of duties and it's about you know certain taxes that you need to pay as a citizen as opposed to a non-citizen. Uh, a great one historically has been, uh, you know, the privilege of being drafted into the military uh, to serve uh, your country at your country's will and whim. So do you think that, um, that potentially characterizing uh, citizenship purely as a, as a privilege, almost like as a commodity is, is a bit too narrow and doesn't necessarily capture the fulsomeness of it. Uh, Sam. So I'm not sure of any taxes in Australia that non-citizens are exempt from. So off the bat there, I think uh, there's a lot of non-citizen Australians who would, you know, be quite happy to have access to um, jobs that are restricted to Australian-only citizens. So I think it's possibly more so those organisations choosing to exclude um the people that don't have the citizenship, which kind of, you know, goes back to it being a privilege thing, you know, most likely, I guess it comes back to the matter of reality, you know, like Australian eyes only type security clearance for these roles. Um, so I think probably that whilst I understand the concepts of civic duty, I do think that there are a lot of permanent residents or non-citizens who are still just as civic in their um, loyalty as such, and they just lack these privileges, such as the right to vote and actively participate. And of course, like citizenship is open to them if they can pay the bills, jump the loopholes and all that stuff. But um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of people probably that are not citizens that are, um, you know, detrimentally uh, impacted because of that. So yeah, I, I truthfully don't think, at least in Australia, citizenship is a burden at all. Uh, response to him before we chuck to Simon, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, um, there's also then, from your perspective, the argument, there is a lot of Australians who are living overseas, uh, in some cases for very extended periods of time, maybe living in like Southeast Asia or living in countries with particularly permissive tax codes or which they gain a lot of benefit out of uh, living in countries that may be developing, in which case they've got great economic opportunities in those locations, but then still expect the Australian taxpayer uh, to foot the bill for them to be brought home, even though, and I'm not saying this is necessarily all of them, but there are definitely some uh, who are using their uh, expatriate uh, positions to you know, make a lot of bank and not pay a lot of tax. Uh, do you think 
that potentially where there is like, you know, people who are Australian citizens uh, who, or, or potentially, for instance, people who have gained citizenship just because they have a parent uh, and they've never actually set foot in Australia, never contributed to Australia civically or financially, do we instead need to maybe rebalance citizenship from those people to people that do actively contribute to, to Australia and maybe make that process a bit smoother? I think we should probably chuck to Simon first. He's had his hand up for a bit. Yeah, um, I've completely lost what I was going to talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll now talk into Tim's one. The question always comes with uh, where do you draw the line? Like, obviously, you go, okay, cool. So if they've been, you know, they've never set foot in Australia, so therefore we should cut off their thing. But then, like, where do you draw? So, like you said, the civically minded, did you say was the um, keyword that you were using, Tim? Yeah, yeah, civically minded. Yep. How do you quantify that? How do you quantify somebody who is civically minded versus somebody who is not civically minded? Is there like a test we can do specifically? And therefore, is that breaking several protections that we're trying? Well, you know, the UN for all its, you know, wonderment. Uh, yeah, there hasn't quite managed to put like the minimum requirements that isn't coercion or whatnot. So like, what is something we can look at? You know, that person is civically minded. Like, where, where do we draw that line? And when do they stop being, you know, this burden on society? I think you raise a pretty interesting question as well, Simon, because, you know, if someone is imprisoned or going through rehabilitation or, you know, even just somebody who is like uh, mentally or physically disabled, uh, maybe through no fault of their own, or but also potentially no fault of the states, at what point do you say this person is not contributing enough to society, therefore they have like reached citizenship level beta. They shall be removed, struck from the records, and no longer have access to free healthcare. Like it's it's a it's a valid a valid point. And I mean I think we can see uh what is some pretty contentious policy with regards to like the removal of uh, people from Australia to New Zealand because they've you know committed crimes uh, and have failed the good character test, but who have never really actually lived in New Zealand their entire lives. Um, and I suppose there'd probably be something similar in a lot of the European nations where there's people that, because of you know the freedom of movement between the countries, uh, people who are non-citizens but who have never actually really lived in the country of their so-called you know citizenship sam um oh well, again you don't need to be a citizen to get free health care in australia or permanent residents have um, access to the medicare system so yeah again we almost because of the degree to which we have um, rights given to people with permanent residency, I would almost argue that we already have these two degrees of citizenship in Australia. We've almost got like a provisional citizenship and then a fledged citizenship. Um, very much so... Uh, shit. What's the movie? It's like almost semi-fascist movie and they go off and fight bugs in it and it's based on a book. Starship Troopers. Thank you, yeah. Um, you know, the concepts in part raised in the book are um, the requirement to serve in order to get the rights. And I can kind of like understand that to a degree. I don't think I necessarily support it, but I can understand where it's coming from. And so what do you guys think? Should there have to be a metric of give before you can take, you know, should everyone say who's born in Australia or who migrates here be given provisional citizenship or, you know, citizenship class B and once they meet whatever these requirements we dictate are, they become fully fledged citizens. So they could join our armed forces. They could take roles in the public service. They could vote. They could get a sausage. You know, what do we think on that concept? So I think I like the issue. I think is that if you have people who so one of the big things, I suppose, with Starship Troopers is that with individuals, everybody starts out as a non-citizen and you then can only qualify for citizenship as an individual. It's like not a not a renewing thing that each individual inherits the citizenship of their parents. And so um, – and, and I th- you're right. There is a bit of fascistic themes there, Sam, in, in that particular book. Uh, but – uh, compared to like the the modern uh, society that we live in now, uh, individuals' citizenship and 
permanent residency. I'm not 100 percent sure on that one, but it transfers from from parent to child. And one of the the things about that is that if you then have, for instance, a child with significant uh, mental or physical disability, or uh, you know, you have uh, someone, and, and this is what I raised as well, is like you know, if an individual if, if we base citizenship on the idea that you need to have contributed or to continue to contribute to society up until a certain point, and then once you reach below that certain point or you, you never retain that certain point, you don't gain the benefits of citizenship, that's where I think the tiering system can can be pretty like pernicious. Um, and I think like permanent residency in Australia is kind of seen as sort of a, a, a halfway house, sort of like as a stepping stone. Uh, to citizenship, although many people decide sort of to stay at PR because for numerous reasons, whether it be that they they can't hold dual citizenship with their their, their country of origin. Uh, Sam, yeah, that's actually the kind of the point I was making is should that be the system? You know, you are not, you know, like take me right. I was fed by the state as a child. I was schooled and educated by the state as a child. Right, you know, like I am who I am because of other people paying taxes. Like, surely I have inherited a debt. Like, don't I, as a citizen of Australia, then have to give this back in order to pay off this debt? Which is broadly the concept of how civic mindedness works, right? But why should I, for instance, get the right to vote in this instance um, and directly participate in the democracy or have these other privileges conferred by citizenship as opposed to, say, the permanent residency thing if I haven't actually ever contributed? And should this be something? You know, worth considering. Thought Simon? I mean, I wouldn't say I agree with it, but yeah, thought Simon? I think this always comes back to a thing that's discussed a lot, which is barrier to entry. And it's whether we need to make it so difficult to enter a system that therefore that's going to protect the system. And I definitely feel like the barrier to entry for citizenship in Australia doesn't need to be ridiculously high. However, um, it, it gets really difficult when you're trying to do a standardized test to work out if somebody is like, it, it's a little bit dirty that you have to work out if somebody is of the right, you know, gumption that you want them as part of your country. I, I feel like it's a bit of a weird one. Um, and as you were discussing like this whole entire, you pay it back sort of thing. The sort of idea is that a weirdly little like socialist one that we all, you know, pull up our bootstraps and then, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest member sort of thing. And it, it sort of brings me back to, there was a, a econo- economist which was discussing how by having like a lowly productive individuals within society, we actually bring our, down the productivity of a whole entire society, not even from like a purely like thing. So I feel like, In relation to the sort of, do we make it a multi-tiered system? I definitely feel like it sort of has to be a sort of, sort of a check in sort of how we do licenses, how we do everything in the respect that it's, are you still living here for one? Are you like, you know, are you actually spending money doing stuff in this country? Because if you're not, then you're not particularly, and I think as globalization sort of becomes this major element that well becomes it is the major element it this whole entire idea that you can say that you're from one particular rock versus a different particular rock doesn't really scale well to like being able to you know i could buy a ticket today and be in the opposite side of the world you know tomorrow um anyway uh whoever wants to take on that they can so i was actually going to say You've raised an interesting point in terms of like how do we, what do we use as the barrier to entry? Um, and it's a pretty contentious thing in Australia, obviously, with things like um, language testing. So the question is like, you know, English is the, the lingua franca, which is mildly hilarious, of, of the land. Uh, but what should be considered a functional level of English that we'd expect of uh, people who decide to take up permanent residency and citizenship in Australia. Uh, And particularly in the context of, you know, the infamous language tests that we used under the White Australia policy that, you know, there are some people that feel as though any form of language testing is a bad thing. Whereas, you know, it's like, even though translation technology has certainly come a ways uh, and there is large numbers of speakers of all kinds of languages in Australia, uh, 
anyone who can speak a language can tell you that through translation and through expression, it's easy to lose a lot of nuance and, and a lot of specific meaning. And it makes it pretty difficult to have uh, in-depth political, philosophical, emotional, ethical conversations uh, which can lose a lot of their nuance in the meaning and translating, particularly machine translation. Now, I suppose uh, one of the things that we have in Australia is the values test. So, you know, they're, they're like, you know, you need to sign up to uh, equality between people regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, ethnic origin, religion, uh, and, you know, sign up to the ideas of parliamentary democracy, liberty, and freedom of speech. Uh, although that's you know pretty much a ticket flick, it's pretty hard to actually litmus test somebody to make sure that they're not just you know paying lip service. But um, in some countries, like uh, Switzerland is a great example, uh, when it comes to citizenship, uh, and you want to move and become a citizen in Switzerland, you need to have your neighbours actually vouch for you as a as sort of a a good character test to say that they are willing to accept you as a fellow citizen in in their neighbourhood. And I know there was an Australian woman, or it might have been a Kiwi. Uh, who was in New Zealand, who was a very vocal uh, vegan. And I'm neither here nor there when it comes to the argument of uh, the morality of consuming animals uh, or animal products. Uh, but she was very vocal in the way that she went about her business. And uh, when she then went and tried to become a Swiss citizen, she was actually uh, blocked because her neighbors did not particularly like the idea of having to deal with her as a citizen, uh, let alone as a, 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 a permanent resident living in that country. So, uh, is it purely normative? I would, I'll throw it both to you guys. Like uh, the barrier that we throw up to citizenship, is that something that, uh, you know, we can we can really uh, draw in the line in the sand? Like you need to have contributed X taxes uh, to the economy over Y period of time. Uh, and if you fall below that quota, then you are, you know, potentially uh, on, on the chopping block for, for being uh, removed. Uh or do we, do we need to maybe instead sort of throw it to the pub test and say, you know, this individual is your citizen, you know, I'll put up on a non-renewable contract every every year. Uh, everyone goes in front of the, the local council assembly and we all vote on who's going to be ostracized this year, you know, Athenian style. Sam? I personally, if, you know, if this hypothetical system got implemented, I would, like the concept of the ability to revoke citizenship, I find vaguely abhorrent. Like, I do not think the state, once it's given citizenship, should have the right to take away citizenship. You know, so it doesn't matter, like, how many other countries you're a citizen of. You know, once the state has bequeathed it on you, because you as a citizen are in charge of dictating who is in charge of the country. Like, you know, the citizens create the state. Therefore, the state shouldn't be able to dictate who its citizens are. So, you know, like, once you have citizenship, that's it. You know, you shouldn't lose it in my mind. We're not... Uh, city states of Greece anymore, um, and you know I like the idea of asking your neighbours. I do kind of kind of like that. Um, I know when you're going for PR, you need um, character references. So I can't imagine why for citizenship that's unreasonable. I don't think, as Simon was discussing before, like I think there are very big flaws if it was a sit down test type thing. And you know, it's like, how do you eat your democracy sausage? You know, like fuck off with that shit. But um. I'm sure there are metrics we could determine, um, you know, to dictate how well someone has contributed to society. Yeah, do, do you pick up rubbish in the park? If you do, yeah, we'll let you in. Do you pick up your dog's crap? You're in. Simon? Uh, I think the issue actually really <laughs> links back into yours because we actually had a really good bit, which actually was my one, which I was discussing, like personhood, which we've just covered ridiculously well. But, you know, do you pick up your thing? How do you draw that when, like, somebody is limited severely physically and mentally? Where, how would we do that for that? Because obviously, uh, a lot of these people are highly dependent on the system that we're in. And when you're in that awkward position where, like, you need to gain citizenship, however, you physically can't interact with the world, or you have such a difficult barrier between you and others to be able to, like, converse, how can we draw that sort of line of uh, citizenship, uh, Sam? I guess um, the major right, citizenship in Australia at least, you know, to stick to Australia because that's where we bloody well are, um, is um, the right to vote. You know, that's the major um, advantage of citizenship. Um, you know, the ability to participate in the creation of the state. Um, 
of the government as such. So if this person's in such a state that they are unable to actively participate in society anyway, I mean, could they actually take advantage of their right to vote? You know, say if this person's um, quite quite seriously disabled, um, struggles to think, et cetera, et cetera. Are they actually truly able to... Um, I'm going to hijack your question here, Simon, to a degree, and I apologize. Because, um, you know, are they actually people? Because what I was going to talk about today, and I know we're running out of time, so this might be a big one, boys, um, is um, non-human persons. So, you know, like, you've got seashells there, uh, whales and dolphins there. They seem quite clever. There's evidence of them even having metacognition. You know, so thinking about thinking. You know, they did this test on dolphins where two options, the dolphins had been rewarded for answering the right one in the situational question. When the answer was obvious, the dolphin was very quick in figuring it out, right? When the answer was less obvious, you could visually see the dolphin stopping and attempting to problem solve. So here you have the creature, you know, playing out um, the potential paths. So it's taking itself, casting it forward in time, dictating what the outcome is going to be, and then making a choice. So if we take this animal that is clearly, well not clearly, but probably conscious, clearly intelligent, uh, able to problem solve, work in a team, interact with other animals, um, but we say it isn't a person, why do we then say, you know, someone in a vegetative state is a person? So... Oh, I'll kick off and I suppose in responding to that one, Sam. I think when it comes to personhood and its intrinsic link to, if not citizenship, which is can be very specific, but like a, a, like sort of like a common community of peoples. And I'm not saying humans here necessarily, because I mean it could be an AI, it could be an alien, anything capable of like higher order thought. The the issue comes down, I suppose, to our ability to communicate, and that's really what politics is. I think, in some ways, it's you know the 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 art and science of manipulating people, for want of a better word, but like uh, interacting with other individuals to get them to do things that you want. Um, and so, citizenship and and personhood, I suppose, provide a framework uh, by which we interact with people, and, and when we cognitively or by some sort of uh, epistemological sleight of hand, strip somebody of their personhood so we don't treat them like humans. For instance, um, you know, the way that Europeans treated uh, Africans in certain circumstances where they're saying, well, they're essentially subhuman. So they don't, they don't deserve the same rights or the same treatment. Um, and I suppose animal rights activists, whether it be someone like Peter Singer, would say that we, we play that same trick uh, when we start talking about, uh, you know, dolphins and say that they're not, they're not, or, or, or whales, I mean, both of which have historically been hunted, uh, but he would argue even further down the food chain, something like a pig or, you know, a dog, uh, where these things can, can suffer. These things have clearly, uh, well, not necessarily as you say clearly, but they do have uh, complex uh, thought patterns. Uh, how, how and where can we draw that line? I, I think the issue with personhood is that if you can't, effectively communicate higher order thoughts with um, another creature, you can't necessarily really treat them like a, a peer in terms of from a political sense. So uh, dolphins could be, well, dolphins do appear to be very intelligent, but um, I suppose it would, things would definitely really change if we found a way, uh, and I don't know if it's necessarily a cognitive issue um, in terms of them not having developed a language uh well, the language portion of the brain to the same level that primates or particularly humans have, uh, or if it's it's merely an issue of translation. Uh, but if we were ever to reach a point at which we could communicate effectively uh, with dolphins, or with whales, or with an AI, or with an alien species, I would I would argue that you're right in the sense that we would have to consider them as humans and, and co-equal. Well, not humans. We'd have to consider them as people and co-equal in rights. Um, Sorry, I was going to say throw to Simon for an answer well, before we throw it back wanted, to you. Just wanted to bounce back quick off because you, you kind of skirted the question. You answered the part about animals quite well, but you to a degree skirted whether or not you think a person, as in like a human who is incapable of 
same order of functions as a human or of less than, say, an animal that we don't count as a person, would you still think of them as a person? I think that you're right in the sense that – so we, we – I think it's pretty well acknowledged uh, through most criminal history, and Simon can correct me here. But like, even uh, if you go back as far as like, you know, the 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 Roman legal code, it's always been accepted that if someone is not of sound mind or sound body in in a decision making process and was incapable of making a decision, uh, which would have been acceptable or would which we would find acceptable for an individual uh in a in a different like in a sound state of mind and health to make that decision uh, that we don't necessarily find them culpable from a criminal perspective and I, I think really intuitively that just feels like that should map across to citizenship and should map across to political rights as well because you wouldn't trust uh, you know, no, you wouldn't want to trust Mad King George with you know the ongoing uh, ship of state in you know Britain uh, around the the turn of the uh, the eighteenth century. Uh, however, I don't necessarily think, and and this is the same thing I suppose that like uh, animal rights ethicists would say is that just because something isn't necessarily a person uh, or something isn't necessarily a a human even. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you have the the rights to deal with them as if they were chattel or you know rocks. Um, Simon. And now I get to begin. Okay. Um. So first and foremost, everything's on the spectrum. So where do you draw that line? So for example, when you say somebody is like mentally, so like if we're trying to use the criminal code, when do we reach a point if they were able to, as most brains heal over time or change over time? When can you definitively go, okay, well, they are definitely of a intellectual rigor that I am allowing them to vote. And then at the opposite end of the spectrum, how do you stop people who you probably don't deem to be having enough problem solving or like a level of mental fortitude to be able to vote? How do you stop them from voting? Um, and if we're going to use the criminal code thing, uh, it regularly runs into the issue of once somebody gets – uh, it's this funny thing of people go, oh, well, I played in, plead insanity and I get a lesser sentence. 90 times out of 100, uh, you're more likely to get a longer sentence simply because the mental health system is really good for getting people in, very difficult to get people out because everything you will do has to beyond prove that you're insane, prove that you're sane, which is a really weird thing for humans to be able to do because the more you try and prove yourself sane, the more insane you become because you are just it's this. So even if we even if we're talking about somebody who, and then there's also this whole entire other element, which is technology being able to be used as sort of a thing, which then comes in with the translation element, which is, are we therefore actually being able to translate the exact complexity and nuance of the person's like opinions through the electronic medium? Uh, the best example that comes to mind is uh, Stephen Hawking, who quite literally later in his life physically couldn't move and could barely talk, but through the aid of a very complex wheelchair was able to um, have full discussions. But uh, you got to realize that even if somebody was of a, you know, average intellect, would that mean that they would be dragged further down the rung and therefore be deemed to be not fit to be able to vote? Uh, Sam? I think you've just hit the nail right on that head there, Simon. And it's the issue we um, face with animals all the time. It's like, how the fuck do you know? Because, you know, like, if we existed, we were saying, having this conversation 100 years before, or if Stephen Hawking lived 100 years before, you know, like, without the technology we have today that enabled his brilliant mind to continue to express itself, because, you know, it's fine, it's still working, the mind is willing, but the body is weak type thing. So, how can you judge? Do we just have to act on the assumption then that all living entities should have baseline rights? Now, everything that is alive has to be treated as though it is conscious. You know, what do we do? Because, yeah, I think you're exactly right. How can we make the assumption that something is dumb and it doesn't matter because it's stupid? Well, uh, on that note, I suppose that would lead into another discussion about uh, you know where do we draw lines and, and, and what is living or what is dead uh, but I think we've kind of run out of time for today so uh, 
thank you very much, gentlemen. Another interesting conversation. And for our listeners, I hope you tune in again next time. This great warrior has left to his martyr lord.